We're holding in Sefer Mishle, Perek Yud Gimel, chapter 13. For those of you who have been here before in the earlier chapter, some of these ideas may sound very familiar because he does repeat himself from time to time. And this chapter is not an exception, especially the first half, which we'll do today. Uh, many times he presents the same idea, but however he puts a slightly different emphasis here the emphasis is in dealing with children early on how it's important to identify attitudes because as we will see later on there's a lot you can recognize in a child early on and if you allow these tendencies that are there already to develop later on it may be more difficult to deal with so some of these attitudes good and bad need to be pointed out need to be identified and need to be worked on if they're not good attitudes. When we're speaking about a tzaddik and rasha, the terms perhaps may sound very sharp. Tzaddik, righteous, rasha, wicked. But as I think I've explained in the past, every one, in a, every one of us has perhaps certain, who know certain characteristics that may qualify them to be a rasha. It's not that the entire individual is a rasha. There are certain tendencies, certain attitudes, certain hashkafod, views um, that individuals may have that are completely wrong. It, it's not that it's a gray area. Things are usually black or black and white. Either something is correct and proper, or it's not. And Shlomo Melech helps us a lot in this area of behaviorism, attitudes, to identify them early on, if possible, and to deal with them as necessary. The first pasuk is an important pasuk. Ben Chacham Musar Av Veletz Lo Shama Gyara. A wise son hears his father's instruction. But a scorner, a clown, does not accept rebuke. Commentaries explain that a child becomes smart as a result of all the Musar. Even though the simple translation is a wise son will hear, will pay attention. But there's something else here, that he will become smart as a result of listening to all that important Musar. After all, most of the time, a father really means well for his son, he wants the best for his son, he has more experience than the child. The, the child doesn't realize that, doesn't always agree. But if he happens to be a, a good child and pays attention, he will gain a lot from the Musar of his father, he will have early on all this good advice that will help him in life. So he will become a hacham as a result of the Musar of the father. Whereas a letz, a clown usually scorns, he makes fun. And as a result of this immaturity, you may call it, and not, not being a very responsible person, not having a good attitude towards life, life is serious. So early on, if this child behaves like a clown, makes fun of everything, he won't listen to anything. It's a contradiction. To listen means to take something seriously. But one who has this attitude of making fun will not get anywhere. And he, it's interesting, he says, Lo shama ge'ara. Ge'ara is, is much more than just a rebuke. It's to actually yell at him. But if, if he has a poor attitude, even yelling may not do any good. And this may require, this, uh, you know, some other means of getting to his attention if one has, if a child has this attitude of scorning everything. But ultimately, the Musar is what will make one wise. And if one does not take any Musar, he, will, he may remain for the rest of his life a let's. There are a lot of older people who one may think because of their age they're mature, but they behave like little children. They're not mature. That is because they've never accepted rebuke they never learned, never were willing to learn. And we've said all along that this is an important step for growth. Growth, whether it is for a child to grow and develop, or for, between a husband and a wife for their relationship to, to grow, they must be willing to listen to each other. Communication is very, very healthy, very important. And if one is unwilling to listen, to stop for a moment and to listen to his wife's complaints, to her sensitivities, it is not possible for them to grow. He's putting an automatic block 
He's putting the brakes on, on this potential growth. They may be perfect for each other. There may be great chemistry between the two. But because of this attitude of not willing to listen to somebody else's criticism, not being patient or tolerant with some other's weakness, and this is the wife that you love and you care for. If she has a weakness, who will be better to help her than yourself when the parents are no longer in the picture as much? But some people simply because they lack the tolerance and the patience or they get so engrossed in their business and their impersonal ambitions that they don't realize that this is priority number one more than the money and more than anything else and soon the kids come and tear apart the couple in a sense because they want their attention too and that is how the tensions in life accumulate and before you know it many couples drift however if they make it a priority to listen to each other to take some time off and talk and go out and really be sensitive to each other then it has of course a tremendous potential of growing together and becoming one which is what the goal of the Torah. The Torah prescribes that as what marriage represents, not only bringing about children to this world, which is the mitzvah of Pru but Kadosh Baruch Hu intended for this neshama, which is really one in the upper worlds, but as it comes down, it splits into two, to come back together in Tovim Ashnaim in Ahad. When the two really work together, not against each other, they can accomplish such a great deal. They have no idea how much can be accomplished when people work together and not against each other. What's required? Patience, tolerance. After all, men and women do not always speak the same language. So one has to have the right attitude. One has to really be patient and try to see, you know, what the issues really are and how they can best be resolved. Patience and tolerance. That leads us to the next pasuk. Miprifi ish yochal tov nefesh bogedim hamas. A man shall eat good from the fruit of his mouth. Loosely translated here in this translation. But the desire of the transgressors is for violence. In other words, rabbis tell us that ultimately one will reap the rewards of all his good actions or the opposite. Whatever you invest, that is what you reap. Lefim mashe mashkim, zemashe kotsrim. In other words, it all depends on what you put in. If a person invests good, he will benefit from it. If he does not make an effort to invest in a relationship, for example, in his children, after all we're talking about here, the chinuch of the children, the education of the children. If one does not invest, does not make an effort, and he just gives up on the, this child who's clowning around, and is not taking his studies seriously, then eventually... That is what he's going to reap. Even though we all have free will, and there's so much we can do, but we have to try. So, ultimately, if one benefits from his efforts, it's because he invested. It's not coincidental. But those who desire the violence, those the desire of the transgressors is for violence. In other words, if that's what they want, that's what they're going to get. It's going to come back at them. In other words, kol echad ochel mi prime ma alalav, as the commentaries say. Each, each one gets whatever he invested. If you put in good efforts, then hopefully he will get some benefit from this one of these days. If he pursued evil, violence, then that's what will come out of those efforts. Notzer piv shomer nafsho. Here's a, in a, a very important investment. How do, does one use his mouth? Mouth is a very powerful organ, I guess we can call it. And one who watches it, Shomer Nafsho, he's watching his soul. Whereas Posek Sefatav Mehitalo, one who opens his lips wide, shall have destruction, or shall fall or fail. Here he's reminding us of how dangerous the mouth is how some people act impulsively and they just talk whatever is on their mind whereas if they would watch themselves so the commentaries the commentaries tell us that whoever speaks mitoch yeshuva dat calmly he thinks about, he reflects about what he's about to say the chances are that he will be protected 
from making any serious mistake. And one who does not, who just opens his lips wide, mehitalo, he very, very likely, one of these days at least, he will make a big mistake. Sometimes we're tempted to criticize, to yell back in anger. We make many mistakes. And life is full of, many, of mistakes that are made specifically by this mouth that we're talking about. The posek sefatav, the opening the mouth wide. That leads to all sorts of problems. Not only in human relationships, but in committing transgressions like lying, lashonara, mahloket, divisiveness. All of this, where does it come from or where does it begin? With the misuse of the mouth. And it's very tempting to answer back. And one of the, it's, a, it's a tremendous challenge to be able to control yourself. But what are true accomplishments in life if not working on one's character and, and midot how much money one will make I've already said it hundreds of times perhaps is not an accomplishment because it's one's mazal I was just told that there's somebody here in Los Angeles that does not know a word of English he came from Iran I'm not going to mention the name because many of you may know him but he is a millionaire and he doesn't know a word of English and he has all this money because what does it have to do with it? It has to do with his mazal. That's all. Obviously, he has to make the effort. He has to put a down payment, perhaps, and buy a building. And if he has luck, mazal, then the building will go up in value, etc., etc. You have to make... But he doesn't have to know a word of English. He didn't have to get a PhD. He didn't have to do that much to make this all this money. True accomplishments in life, and what Judaism looks up to and admires, is... Is this man a God-fearing man? Is he a good husband, a good father? These are accomplishments because they're not natural. Human beings are selfish by nature, some more, some less. But we are all somewhat selfish. A child comes into this world as a baby with his hands, with his fist closed. Everything is mine, mine, mine. When we leave this world, our hands are like this because we let go of everything. But while we're alive and as soon as we arrive, we want everything for ourselves. Judaism teaches one to become a giver, not a taker. And that takes a lot of work. The, the mitzvot were intended to help us accomplish that goal of being a giver and not a taker. And that's not easy. It's difficult. But if one has an interest in fulfilling this, these mitzvot, in accomplishing this goal, then the Torah will guide him. There are some people who are just not interested, who are unaware that this is the tachlit, the purpose of life. They think they've come here to make money. They got to make as much money as possible. They have to have a house in Palm Springs. They have to have a a, a ranch in uh, Northern California with a stable of horses. They have to have uh, a yacht and a private plane, and they're miserable as long as they don't have that. And everybody has their own tavot, you know, their own their own hobbies, their own desires, and they think that this is the whole tachlit. I remember hearing a interview or reading a, an article by a famous Jew in this city, who I'm not going to mention his name, who had a talk show, and you may figure it out sooner or later. And he has a beautiful house somewhere in the West Valley. And you know what he said about his beautiful house? This is Gan Eden. To him, that was paradise. Gan Eden. You know, it may be that it's comfortable, but is that really Gan Eden? I mean, obviously he was very happy to have that piece of paradise in this world. But obviously he was uh, putting too much emphasis on something which is material. Before you know it, you won't even be able to enjoy it. Some people will have to be in a wheelchair. Some people will be in a, a convalescent hospital. And if they're lucky, you know, they'll be able to walk under two feet. But for how long? For 60, 7, 80 years? But they don't think of that. They think that this is what there is, and you got to do whatever you can to enjoy life. And they forget about the real tachlit. And the real tachlit is having a wonderful relationship with your spouse, with your kids, and being a true God-fearing person. That's basically the tachlit. Shlomo Amelech points it out in Kohelet very clearly. Sof davara kol nishma. What's the bottom line? To fear God. To observe His mitzvot. So the mouth is a very powerful organ. It's something that we need to be careful with.
נקסט פסוק, מתאווה בעין נפשו, עצל ונפש הרוצים תדושן. The nefesh, the soul of the, of the one who is lazy, desires, but he has nothing. The nefesh harutzim tedushan, the soul of the diligent, shall be richly supplied. In other words, commentaries explain that many people desire a lot of good things, midotavot, spirituality, they would like to learn all of these sefarim. They really do. They really want to. If you meet with them after a couple of years and they haven't done anything, what is it indicative of? Plain laziness. If one has the desire for these things, but a couple of years later you meet up with him and he did not even acquire any of those goals and ambitions and, and good plans, it's indicative that he's simply lazy. Or he spent his time doing other things. But laziness is a big factor, is a, a real big problem with why people do not work on themselves. Because it's hard, as we just said. Somebody who is really angry, impulsive, it's really hard to correct that. And if he's lazy, it makes things even worse. But most of the time, that's what Shalom Amalek says many, many times at least, the problem lies in one being lazy and not wanting to... Pre- even though he's convinced, mit'ava, he wants it. But the ayin, if he has none of it, only those who are nefesh harutzim to dushan, those who have some diligence, midat azerizut, which the rabbis really uh, point out as being one of the most beautiful midot, diligence, zerizut, because from zerizut it's a stepping stone, it's a bridge to, cr- to cross over and acquire additional midot. If one is not diligent and he's lazy, he won't get anywhere. דבר שקר ישנה צדיק ורשע יבאיש ויחפיר. That's פסוק number five, פסוק A. A righteous, a righteous man hates lying, but a wicked man יבאיש ויחפיר. יבאיש ויחפיר means to put others to shame, to make fun of others, to ridicule others. Very important difference in the attitude of these two individuals. A צדיק does not want to lie, about who? About what? We're not even just talking about plain lying. We're talking about a situation the commentaries explain where this tzaddik just was involved in a fight, in a lawsuit. He has a baldin who was suing him or he was suing him. They got into a big fight. And what happens after, at the end? Regardless of the outcome of this lawsuit, it's very tempting for the tzaddik to bad mouth. For this to bad mouth his uh, opponent. No. Devar Shekir is not Sadiq. When we say Sadiq, as I said earlier, don't think of this as being a righteous man. It's Sadiq. What we're talking about is the Midah of a Sadiq. The righteous attitude is to not bad mouth anybody even though he was your opponent. Don't bad mouth him, don't talk Rashonara about him, don't lie about him, don't say anything bad about him. Because the Midah of the Rasha is Yavish Viyahpir. It's the, the midah of bad mouthing, of ridiculing, that belongs to a rasha. Regardless of who's right and who's wrong, there's no reason to bad mouth. According to the Kabbalah, when one misuses his mouth, whether it's to bad mouth or to talk unnecessary things about someone, he's hurting his neshama. He's taking away a little bit of his neshama. I don't know exactly what that means, that he's taking away a portion of his neshama, but somehow his neshama is affected by excess words, and especially harmful words. It hurts the neshama in some way. Next, Pasuk, Tzedakat Yitzor Tam, Darech, V'rish'a Tesalev Chatat. Righteousness, that's what the word Tzedakah means, but it also means charity, keeps him who is upright in the way. The Rish'a, which is evil or wickedness, overthrows the sinner. In other words, one who is righteous, one who does tzedakah, the tzedakah will protect him, will keep him in, in, in the right track. One does not have to fear, as we said in the past, from doing the right thing. He won't get hurt from doing the right thing. The tzedakah will protect him. But one who is wicked, one who goes in a crooked way, because he's doing things in a crooked way, in a crooked manner, it will mislead him. 
He will not stay on the right track. He will make mistakes. He will fail. So the right thing to do is to, to, to do tzedakah, to be righteous, to be honest, and not to be afraid of doing the right thing. A lot of people tell me, you know, in this country, if you want to make a living, you have to lie. No, it's not true. It's totally untrue. They tell me in Israel, if you pay your income tax, you can't make a living. That may be so. <laughs> because they take away more than 55%. And when they come and audit you, they tell you, well, this is what you should have made. Even though you show them the papers, but this is how much I earned. We don't believe you. We, we say that this is how much you really made. You know, when you're dealing with that kind of a government, when that kind of a philosophy, then that's a big problem. You know, unfortunately, many, many Israelis have left Israel only because of income tax, only because of the problems with the government. You know, they're forcing people to lie and to cheat because they cannot meet that goal and make a normal living. I don't believe that that situation exists here. So whoever tells you that, that you have to lie to make a living, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. But don't accept that, you know, that you have to, in order to survive, you have to lie. Tzedakah titzor tamdarek, the tzedakah will keep you on the right track. You will not get hurt by doing the right thing. All of these midot, as I said before, the good characteristics, the good uh, nature uh, that one is developed requires a lot of hard work. Uh, it does not come easy. And some people are born with certain tendencies and have certain temptations and challenges. And if one does not learn Musar, or one does not have a regular shiur for Torah, then uh, he may do the wrong things. We all have Yitzarim. As long as one is alive in this world, even if he's 99 years old, he has the Yitzarah for something. And if one does not have the strength to combat the Yitzarah, he may do the wrong thing. That is the importance of... Musar, Mishle is, a, is a, an example of a book that has Musar, the good advice, the ethics, the proper way of, leading, of uh, living our lives. And a lot of this advice applies to non-Jews as well. This is just plain good advice. Yesh mitasher ve'en kol mitroshesh behon rav. There is one who pretends to be rich, he has, he has nothing, and then there is one who pretends to be poor, yet he has great riches. This particular pasuk has various interpretations. One is, the, what I just read to you, there are some who pretend. They pretend to be wealthy, but they're poor, or they, have, they don't have that wealth. And there are some who are poor, and there are some who are wealthy, but they pretend to be poor. What does that mean? It could be a disguise. Don't just look at outside appearances. Don't look at an individual by what he does and how he spends his spending habits it could be that it's all the skies that's one interpretation don't be misled or fooled by what you see the additional interpretations are as follows there are some people who live beyond their means in other words they have no money but they live beyond their means they borrow money from people in order to be able to make a big simcha a big bar mitzvah and it's beyond their means they should not borrow that money you're supposed to live according to your means. There are some who, of course, are rich and not living according to their means. That's a little bit better. They don't need to. Another interpretation is, Yesh mitasher ve'en kol. There are some people who have a lot of money, but they're not happy. It is as though they have nothing. And there are some people who are poor, mitroshesh ve'on rav, and they have or they feel they have everything. That's called Sameach Vechilko, one who is happy with his lot, with whatever Hashem has given him. That is true happiness. There are some that lead a life, a very simple life. There are some who lead a not simple life, a very luxurious life. Obviously that's not too good. There's a story with uh, the brother of Rabbi Ovadia mi Bartenora. Ben Ovadim Martinora is a famous commentary in the Mishnayot. He spent most of his life learning, putting together his commentary, and he had a very good brother, a rich brother, who supported him. This rich brother who supported lived a very modest life, even though he was a, he was a very rich man. 
once two guests stayed over his house one of them one of the guests was a famous rabbi and they were shocked this is a rich man who was so dedicated to the mitzvah of achnasat urchim you know to having guests all his time he didn't really care so much about his business he, he liked taking care, taking care of people took care of his brother and despite all his wealth he lived very modestly and all the members of his family were dressed like very simple poor people not with rags but very very simple they bought all their clothing at the 99 cent store you know something like that you know very very simple and so the rabbi came over to him and says I don't understand you can allow yourself I mean why you know you, Baruch Hashem you have all this wealth says I'd rather use my money to support my brother I'd rather use my money to have guests over all the time and because I put all my money into this mitzvot I have to hold myself back from spending on myself and my family and we don't mind anyway we don't really need it it takes a tremendous amount of courage and self-control obviously to to implement this a lot of people would like to talk about it and learn about it and they say it but to actually implement it in their lives it's, uh, you don't have to do that Baruch Hashem everybody who who, who blessed is permitted to live according to his standards but it just shows you where the emphasis was in this individual Mitroshesh Vehon Rav he really lives a modest life but he really he also has a tremendous amount of wealth he just decides to use that wealth in a different way, not on himself. Next pasuk, Kofer nefesh ish oshro v'rash lo shama ge'ara. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor hears no threat. A man's money, a man's wealth, could be his ransom. You know what the word ransom means? A pidyon shelo, a kofer shelo. In other words, if a person is kidnapped, they ask for ransom to release him, right? If a person is very, very ill, we give tzedakah to try to ransom him from his sickness. Gaon of Vilna says on this pasuk that sometimes a Kadosh Bahu sends an individual a lot of money all of a sudden so that he should have with what to redeem himself if there would be a terrible decree, a gezerah against him. So he should be able to use that money to redeem himself, to use that money for what? To give it to tzedakah. So the commentaries explain that when you give tzedakah, you just have to be careful not to embarrass the poor man. In order for the tzedakah to be done 100%, you can't yell at the poor man, next time get yourself a job, don't bother me every year. You know, it would be best not to give the poor man any money than to yell at him. As I've explained in the past, the rabbis tell us that one gets more blessings from encouraging a poor man, making him feel good, than from the little money that he gives him. So, Kofar Nefesh Ish the wealth that one has, in, in some ways, could be his ransom. It could save his life, if he uses it properly for tzedakah. But Verash Lo Shama Gara, but the poor hears no threat. What does that mean? The poor man who does not have the money, will not suffer in the same way as the rich man. Hashem will not send him something to redeem himself from because he doesn't have the money to redeem himself. So sometimes the poor man has a more easy life than the rich man because the rich man who has to somehow provide a way for him to get out of his tarot by way of using his money. The poor man does not have the money. So Hashem leaves him alone. So sometimes the rash, lo shama ge'ara, he doesn't hear any cries. He hears no threat. Because Hashem will not, tefillah is the first thing that we're supposed to attempt, to pray to Hashem. But sometimes what's necessary as a kapara is money. And one who has been given the money, it may be for that purpose alone, to save his life. Or tzadikim yismach vener rashaim yidach. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. He uses the word lamp. Ner means a candle. There's a difference between or and ner. Or is a tremendous amount of light that comes about from learning Torah. Whereas the ner, the light of a candle, is for the performance of a mitzvah. 
כי נר מצווה ותורה אור, אז הפסוק says, the נר is equivalent to a מצווה. A מצווה has light, but the Torah has even greater light. And what is the difference between the light of the Torah and the light of a candle? The rabbis tell us in the Gemara, when one learns Torah, when one learns Torah regularly, the Torah has the ability to protect him from sin and from any calamities even after he has finished his class, even after he's gone home. The mitzvah can protect one while he's performing the mitzvah. As you may have heard about shlichem mitzvah, one who's on a mission to perform a mitzvah, and anezukim, they are in the midst of performing a mitzvah. We give somebody a dollar when he's about to travel, to give to for tzedakah as soon as he arrives at his destination, so he's a shliach mitzvah. The mitzvah offers some protection while one is performing the mitzvah. Once you let go of the mitzvah, there's no guarantee that that protection is still there. It's only like the light of a candle, whereas the order of the Torah continues to protect one even later. The Or Tzadikim Yismach, therefore the light of Tzadikim will enliven them or will make them happy. This is the light of the Neshama as well that, will, that they will rejoice with in Olam Abba. Whereas the candle of the Rishaim Yid'ach, it will be put out. That little candle, the little bit of mitzvot that they may have performed, Hashem rewards them in this world. And before you know it, it's over with. The same is true with Ishmael, with the Arabs. The Zohar says that Ishmael, being a child of Abraham Avinu, has some credit, has some zechuyot. For what reason? Not just for being Abraham Avinu's son, but for the Brit Milah. And as soon as that zechut will terminate, they will be expelled from Eretz Israel. And that is happening right now. It, really, it began to happen as soon as the Ottoman Empire was kicked out of Israel by the British. That is when it began to take hold. But we're still waiting for it to, to happen. It hasn't, has not yet happened completely. And that's for different reasons. What? How do we figure it out? It's about three generations. According to our tradition, the Yemot HaMashiach will, will be three generations. So we have to assume that it's this time, this decade, give or take, that the Zechut will terminate and we will see their downfall. The downfall meaning at, at the, in what, what relates at least to Eretz Israel, the Ahiza, they will no longer have a grip on Israel. It could be that this is delayed because of, unfortunately, because of our Maasim, because of our deeds. Yeah, they never will have a complete grip of Israel. But once the Jewish people start returning to Eretz Israel, you cannot have the two control the same land, the Zohar says. One has to give way. As our tradition says, when Yishmael is on top, Yitzhak is not on top. When Yitzhak is on top, Yishmael is down. The two cannot be on top at the same time. So that is why we're having this struggle there. And it has nothing to do with peace. It has nothing to do with oil. It has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with this continuous struggle on a more loftier level than we, than we imagine. But anyway, Baruch Hashem, this is the generation where we're going to see great miracles happen. So the candle of the Rasha, the little bit of light that he may have, the little bit of glory perhaps, or success that he has, that does not last for long. Gid'ach, it will be put out. It will terminate. Commentaries also tell us that uh, the Rishaim continuously, continuously fall. They continuously make mistakes because Avera goreret Avera. One sin leads to another sin. Whereas a tzaddik, because he accumulates schuyot, merits, those merits that he has accumulated help protect him wherever he goes. The light of the tzaddik continuously shines because he accumulates more and more schuyot and these merits help to protect him and help to keep him on the right track. The rasha is regularly making mistakes and one avera leads to another and that is the meaning of the prophecy of Hoshea. Ki chashalta ba'avonecha You have tripped, you have stumbled because of your sins. 
What do you mean? Because of your past sins, they are causing you to stumble again and again and again. Alright, next pasuk is a very important pasuk. Rak bezadon yiten matzah vetnoatzim chokhmah. He translates zadon pride, but I disagree. Rak bezadon, zadon usually means malice, wickedness, not necessarily pride. It is because of malice that comes quarrel. That no atzim chokma, but those who are well advised, there is wisdom. This pasuk has to do with settling problems. There's a problem between two individuals, between husband and wife. How do you deal with it? If there is zadon, if there is malice, you will have a quarrel. If you deal with no atzim, if you seek advice and counsel, then you will have wisdom. You will have a solution. Every problem has a solution. But if you deal with it with zadon, with malice, you attack. That brings to quarrels. Nothing good can come out of quarreling. So how do you deal with a problem? And there are problems in life. There are all sorts of problems. Some are small, some are big. It no atzim. You seek advice. You, th- you seek advice of a third individual who's not biased. Who's not a party to this quarrel. And it's not necessarily a marriage counselor, because a lot of these marriage counselors outside do not have the proper hashkafot. All they want is $250 an hour. And they can't really help you all the time. Some of them are good, some of them are good, but some of them really don't help. And especially if you come, if you come to them after 12 or 15 years of marriage, when you've lost the love and affection for your spouse, nobody can help you. It is still possible to help each other because you can always make a U-turn and restart your relationship, but it's much more difficult if one has not worked on the problems early on. So one of the best ways to work on one's problem is, as I said earlier, through communication. Perhaps you can figure it out on your own. And if not, it no atzim, chokhmah. Seek the advice, the counsel of those who are experienced, of those who, of, of those who can help be careful with malice be careful with with doing or saying something that is not proper that you may regret because you ten matzah that will lead to just quarreling and quarreling and quarreling and after fighting with each other for years and years and years all you're doing is sharing the same roof no love this is not a marriage this is not a marriage this is not a true relationship this is not a friendship what, what is this? I don't know what you can call it. And that is why there's so much divorce today. People just don't want to put up. It doesn't mean that people never fought in the past. People fought in the past. They always fought. But they were able to, they were willing to put up with it. They either gave up, they were willing to put up with it for the sake of the kids. Today people just don't want to put up with it. And they run away from their problems instead of tackling them, doing something about it. Malice is a big problem. Husband thinks his wife is mean to him. Wife thinks her husband is mean. They're not necessarily mean. They're just thinking of themselves. They're not thinking of the problem. But they're not mean. They're not bad. They're not seeing things clearly. They're being maybe a little selfish. But that, that's far from being mean and evil. And a little bit of uh, communication, perhaps a little bit of counsel, will be able to resolve whatever problem they may have. But if there is malice, malice meaning that one tries to attack the other, out of malice comes matzah, comes quarrels. And quarrels don't lead anywhere. Next pasuk. Hon mi hevel yimat v'kovetz al yad yarbe. Wealth acquired by vanity shall be diminished, but he who gathers by labor shall increase. This pasuk also can be translated a little bit differently. Wealth that is gathered in unscrupulous ways mehevel will be diminished, there's no blessing to it but one who works hard for his money kovetz aliyad, little by little every dollar he saves then every, as they say, kol prutam itztarefet every penny adds up small change, they say in English, makes big change just add one penny a day to your piggy bank, is that what they call it? And eventually, kovetz al yad yarbe, it will increase. The commentaries explain that this is also referring to studying, 
to mitzvot, the one who does not work hard will not accumulate. Kovetz al yad, you have to work hard and you have to do it little by little. That is how one can accomplish a great deal over time. When one is doing teshuvah and is becoming stronger, it is very tempting to do everything. Rabbi tells Shazua Tzata Yetzer that that is what the Yetzara is suggesting. Take upon yourself Shabbat, take upon yourself kosher kitchen, take upon yourself to put on tefillin every day, take upon yourself to wash metilat yadaim, take upon yourself to make berachot. All of this at once, be a tzaddik. Who's saying this? Not the Yetzatov, the Yetzara, because he knows Shetafasta merubelo tafasta. If you take everything, you will not do anything. You will give up quickly and not do anything. Kovetz al yad. Take one at a time, one day at a time, yarbe. That is how you will be able to accumulate a lot over time. But it takes hard work. It takes yegi'a, the commentary says. Yegi'a means hard work. One who does not apply hard work, yim'at, hon mehevel yim'at, hon meaning the wealth of his knowledge, will eventually decrease. If you do not work hard to review what you've learned, spend time regularly learning, then eventually one forgets all his learning. It, it, will, de- it will decrease. Kovetz al yad, one who works hard and is consistent, Yarbe over time, he will increase his knowledge base. The next pasuk, Tochelet memushacha machala lev. He's translating it, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Ve'etz haim tava ba'a, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Let me translate it a little bit differently. Tochelet memushacha. One who is looking forward, who is anticipating some, for something. He's longing for something. It could bring him a machala lev. It could really make him, uh, his heart feel pain. Because he's longing for someone. He's longing for something. Imagine... You're waiting for a piece of important piece of mail. I just read in the internet the other day that a lady in Serbia just received a postcard from her father from 63 years ago. The father, who was uh, in World War II, had sent a postcard, and it just it took 63 years to arrive. And that, of course, that was sent to his mother. And this is the, the daughter is the one that received it today. Anyway, it finally came. But imagine if somebody was looking forward <laughs> to something very important and it, and it just didn't come. You know, sometimes we look forward to receiving a package, whether it's Federal Express, UPS. It's very important. So we're looking forward. There's a knock on the door, we go to see, you know, maybe that's what it is. Some people look forward to the IRS refund every year. They really need the money. <laughs> You know, and if the mail comes and it's not it, they feel terrible. That's what he means over here. He doesn't mean about the IRS refund, but toheret memushacha machala lev. When you have this longing for something that is is taking a lot of time, machala lev, it's very painful. But what happens when you get it? Ve'etz chayim ta'ava ba'a. When the ta'ava, when what you've desired comes, it's like an etz chayim. It's like a lifesaver, a tree of life. That's the simple translation of what he's trying to say. The rabbis tell us on this pasuk, what are we talking about? What is Shomo Mena talking about? He's talking about one who's continuously praying to Hashem, the almost demanding of Hashem a certain thing, not just praying and asking nicely, but almost demanding. Machalalev, it will be a very painful experience to him because he will become disappointed when he does not get what he wants. One needs to know how to pray, not to demand it, not to expect, not to insist. But a prayer has to be supplication. Supplication meaning, who have pity on me, and if you think I really need this, give it to me. If you don't think it's good for me, then don't give it to me. You know, try to be a little neutral. Do not demand. Do not necessarily anticipate anything. What should one do, therefore, who's been looking forward in anticipation and he feels terrible? The Etz Chaim Tavaba, the rabbis tell us, the Gemara says, I think, Yasok Torah that he should preoccupy himself with the Torah, he should learn Torah, and perhaps by the merit, the schut of the Torah, he will get what he really needs. If his prayers are not answered, then what should he do? Yasok Torah, which is an etz chaim, which is a tree of life, and in that way, ta'avah he will receive what he, 
he was asking for. The next pasuk, Baz le davar yehavelo, whoever despises the word should be destroyed. I don't like that translation. Whoever despises anything or anybody will get hurt. That's a better translation. Ve'ere mitzvah hu yeshulam, but he who fears the commandment should be rewarded. That's okay. In other words, whoever is Yerei Mitzvah, whoever is careful with any, every Mitzvah. There's two parts to this Pasuk. The first part deals with one who is Baz. Baz meaning whoever despises or makes fun. Rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, Alti Baz Lechol Adam. Don't make fun of anything or of anybody. Because that individual who right now you're making fun of, who is a nobody, one of these days he can be the mayor of Los Angeles. And he'll remember that you made fun of him. So be careful not to make fun of anybody or of anything. Because everything has its moment in place. You may need something in the future. Don't just throw away something which is useful. Some people have a hard time to accumulate everything. In their attic or their basement and garages are full. You know, that's also no good. But something which is useful, don't throw it away. Don't make fun of anything or of anybody. The commentaries tell us who's an example of this. David the Melech. David the Melech says, Hashem, you created the beautiful world. I just can't figure out why you created retarded people. Why are there fools? Shotim v'tipshim. People who are not normal. Who needs them? Hashem says, David, you're telling me I created something for no reason? You're making fun of fools? You're going to have to make a fool of yourself one of these days to save your life. Do you know the story? Yeah. Yeah, with the... But he was crazy. Okay, so crazy, a fool, whatever, Meshuga. What is the story? Yeah. That he was, you know, running away and he was in enemy territory. And uh, not everybody recognized him, not everybody knew who he was. This is David. One guy suspected and thought this was David, and he went over to the king, the enemy. He says, you know what? We've caught David. I have David here. So David says, now what am I going to do? So he started foaming from his mouth and behaving like a fool. Like a and behaving basically like a fool, like somebody who's not normal. And it just happens to be that that king had a daughter who was retarded. So as soon as this guy presents David here, King, this is David, says, you have to remind me about my troubles. I have enough in my house. You have to bring me somebody else who's not normal. This cannot be David. And of course, they, they let him go. That is when he thanked Hashem. Same story with the spider web. Remember the spider? Hashem, what do you need spiders for? But when he was running away from Shaul, he hid in the cave. And Hashem sent the spider to create a big web almost within a very few moments, within a few minutes when the people came by they said he couldn't have gone in there this web has been there for a while so the web saved his life so David and Melech had to learn the lesson that everything who created in this world has a purpose don't make fun of anybody don't make fun of anything there's a reason for everything now what happened when David and Melech when he was running away from Shaul he caught up with Shaul and you know what he did to Shaul he didn't hurt him but he cut the kanaf me'il, the edge of, of Shaul HaMelech's cloak, his uh, robe. robe. He cut the edge just to show him, I got close enough to you to kill you. You see, I didn't touch you. But because this is the Melech Israel, this was the king of the Jews, Hashem said, no, you didn't do the right thing. When David HaMelech was old, what does it say? The Vatsuk says, Vayichasuhu. They covered him up with a lot of clothing and he was not getting warm. He was still cold and shivering despite all the clothing for that one time that he made fun by cutting away a piece of the garment of Shaul HaMelech. So in the end, it all comes back. Don't make fun of anybody, don't make fun of anything. And that is what he says over here, Baz davar yahabelo. It will eventually hurt him if you make fun of someone or something. Virei mitzvah hu yeshulam. One who's careful with mitzvot, who's careful with kashrut, doesn't just buy anything in the supermarket. Oh, I'm just going to read the ingredients. If it 
there's no pork in it, then it's kosher. One who's God-fearing person is really extra careful, goes out of his way, because he doesn't want to make a mistake. That's called Yirei Mitzvah, Yirei Shamaim. He asks when he's in doubt. One who is fearful, one who is careful, who is Shulam, he will be rewarded. He will gain. The commentaries tell us that this is talking about also an individual who is careful with the poor, who come knocking on his door. If he makes fun of them, does not treat them properly, does not help them out, Yehavelo. He will get hurt. As the Pasuk says about charity in the Torah, Ki biglal Hashem. Because if you are charitable, you will be blessed. The commentaries say, why does it say Ki biglal? It should say Ba'avur Zeh, Mipnei Zeh. Why does the Torah use the language biglal? What kind of a word is biglal? Ki zakol galgal achozer ba'olam. Wealth and poverty is like a wheel. There are some people who are on top one day, and the next day they are at the bottom. There are some people who started off very, very poor, but they became rich later on in life. There are some people who started off very, very rich, and they lost all their wealth. What do we see from all of this? The Zohar says that the ma'asim of an individual, one's deeds, are very powerful. In Olamazeh and in the upper worlds too. We think we don't do anything by saying a word, by through our actions, because we don't see the immediate consequences. But whatever we do here has consequences in the upper worlds. A word that is said here is heard there. There are actually malachim, special malachim, who all they do their job is is to catch a word, a bad word, a curse, Chaz Shalom of an individual, say, here, we're going to use this against him. It came out of his mouth. They just wait. They hold on to those words and they, and they wait for the moment and when they're given permission to, to send it back to that individual. One has to be very careful. Rabbis tell us, Lolim sordin al chavero. Not to ask Hashem, Hashem, punish him. Take care of him. You, take, you, you will be the judge. Never say that anybody that asks Hashem to be the judge Say, oh, you're such a great tzaddik, you think of yourself as a tzaddik that you're asking Hashem to be a judge? Let's open up your books and examine what you, know, what you have. As I've said earlier, when one speaks to Shonara, he's bringing himself to court regularly. We're in court usually only once a year, Rosh Hashanah. And here we have an individual who's speaking Shonara, bringing himself into court every single time. Because when one talks bad about someone, he's causing the upper courts to talk about him. If we talk about others, they talk about us. So why bring yourself into, into court on a regular basis? Once a year is enough. Just want to finish up with what we started. We talked about the difference between a tzaddik and a rasha. That we're not necessarily talking about two individuals. We're talking about midot or tchunot, certain characteristics that can be found in every individual. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive. The difference between a tzaddik and a rasha, one of the differences that we discussed was that a tzaddik is careful with not lying, with not cheating, with not making fun, with not bad-mouthing, uh, whereas a rasha is not careful in this area. If one were to see these characteristics in a child, even though we were, we, this applies to everybody, but he started off saying about the musar of a child, if one sees this early on, that a child likes or enjoys making fun, enjoys lying, enjoys mahloket. These are midot of a rasha. We're not saying that this individual is a rasha, but these are midot or tchunot of a rasha. Whereas the tzaddik, even though he may not have it in him by birth, needs to develop the opposite of being, of compromising, of being calm, of controlling oneself. So when you identify these characteristics, you will see, or you will know with who they belong. They don't, all these bad characteristics don't belong with one who wants to be a tzaddik. But as we've said all along, this requires a tremendous amount of work. It's a, it's a work of a lifetime. But kol abali taher misayino tomina shamayim. The rabbis tell us that a kadosh who helps those who help themselves. A couple who really wants to succeed and have a good relationship, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be the third partner as long as you let him into the house. As the famous story with the Kotzke Rebbe, 
he once comes into the Bet Midrash. Anybody can tell me where Hashem is? So the students look at the rabbi, what do you mean? Hashem is everywhere. He says, no, Hashem is wherever you let Him in. There are some people who don't want to let Hashem into their homes. And that is where the home looks the way it is. When one wants to succeed, whether it's in the raising of his children or whether it's in their relationship of husband and wife, don't forget that there's a third, per- a third partner who wants to help if we allow him to help. Okay, if there's no questions, then the Zatashem will continue next week. Thank you.